All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So great to see all of you again. Uh, welcome this evening. My name is Jason Hanley. I am the Vice President of Education and Visitor Engagement here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, and I am Andy Leach. I'm the Senior Director of Museum and Archival Collections for the Rock Hall. And we're really happy to welcome you here tonight to our fantastic panel on celebrating Ray Charles. In fact, today, if you're watching this broadcasting live, it is actually Ray Charles' 91st birthday today. And uh, of course, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, inducted in the very first class back in 1986. That's right. And uh, we're excited to be here tonight to be talking about Ray Charles, talking about this fantastic new box set of his music that has uh, just come out. Um, in fact, Andy's got it right here called True Genius, and we'll be talking a bit about that this evening. Before we get rolling on the program, just a few words about uh, some of our upcoming events, and particularly about our Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 2021 induction ceremony. It is coming up. Our tickets are on sale right now. Um, so get out there. There are a lot, still a bunch of great seats left, although they are going fast. Uh, this year, Andy, a big class, right? I mean, incredible, incredible performers, including Tina Turner, Carol King, the Go-Go's, Jay-Z, Todd Rundgren, and the Foo Fighters. But this really great um, additional set of artists being inducted in the award categories, one of my personal favorites, Kraftwerk. Yep. We've got the great Charlie Patton, Gil Scott Heron, Ella Cool J, Clarence Avant, uh, Billy Preston. I know somebody you and I are both a big fan of Billy Preston. Yep. And Randy Rhodes, also somebody we're both fans of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic guitarist who played with Ozzy. Uh, so check it out. Go to rockhall.com. Not only is the induction ceremony on October 30th at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse here in Cleveland, but we'll have a week of events programmed here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame right here in downtown Cleveland. So again, thank you to everybody for joining us this evening uh, to celebrate Ray Charles' birthday and think about the True Genius box set. And Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about this great box set that just came out that we'll be kind of using as our touchstone tonight. Right. Uh, so it's called True Genius, and it's a newly released six CD box set. It just came out earlier this month on Tangerine Records, which is the label that Ray himself founded in 1962. And it's a limited edition set featuring 90 of Ray's greatest songs. Uh, it's a great representation of his whole career. Marks the first time that some of these songs have, mm -hmm. have ever been on streaming platforms. And it has eight previously unreleased tracks that were were done at a live show in 1972 that we're going to we'll talk, talk about, about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like I said, it's it's presented in this uh, this beautiful kind of coffee table style book with rare photos and liner notes that we'll hopefully talk about as well. Yeah, hopefully we'll talk about tonight. I love some of the shots even there of uh, the album masters, right? The actual reel to reel master That's right. cases in there and everything. I mean, great photos. Uh, in fact, to set the mood and get us started the right way, before we introduced our, our guest to join us this evening, we figured we would start with a uh, lyric video <clears throat> that Tangerine released as part of this True Genius box set release. And it's for the great classic, Hit the Road Jack. So let's take a look at this, and then we'll get started with the panel right afterwards. Enjoy. I guess if you say so, I'll have to pack my things and go. That's right, hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more. What you say? Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more. Now, baby, listen, baby, don't you treat me this away. Well, I'll be back on my feet someday. Don't care if you do, cause it's understood. You ain't got no money, you just ain't no good. Well, I guess if you say so, I'll have to pack my things and go. That's right, hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more. What you say? Don't you come back no more? Well, don't you come back no more? Uh, what 
you said? Don't you come back no more. I didn't understand Don't you. Don't you come back no more. You can't mean that. And don't you come back oh, no more. Oh, now, baby, please. Don't you come back no more. What you trying to do to don't me? Well, that's a great way to start a program, no doubt. Doesn't get any better. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Classic. All right. Well, let's bring in our panelists for the evening. First up, I'd like to introduce John Burke. Uh, he's a multi-platinum and multi-Grammy award-winning producer, as well of, as one of the founding partners of Concord Music. Under John's uh, creative direction, Concord diversified its artist roster and grew substantially from a highly respected boutique jazz label to become one of the largest independent music companies in the world. Some of John's notable artist signings include Ray Charles, James Taylor, Paul McCartney, Billy Gibbons, Santana, many more, all Rockle inductees, yeah. by the way, right? Uh, good roster. I would take yeah. that any day. Not bad. <laughs> One of John's productions, Ray Charles' Genius Loves Company, won eight Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year and Record of the Year. And I think, too, we can ask him in a minute. I think it was uh, one of the last records Ray recorded before, right before he passed. The last one of his life. Though. In fact, let's bring John on and we can uh, see if that fact is true. John, welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. My pleasure. So, John, I was going to say, isn't Genius Loves Company, wasn't that one of the last records Ray worked on uh, while he was still alive? Isn't that right? Well, yeah, that was his last record. Yeah. Um, he, he became ill about halfway through it. Uh, he got liver cancer. And uh, wow. so it was, it was literally... Uh, I think the last song he ever sang was on that record. Uh, Sorry seems to be the hardest word with Elton John. Wow, amazing, amazing. Well, we'll come back and talk more about that and some of the other great work you've done with Ray. And Andy, you want to introduce our other panelists for the evening? Yeah, it's an honor for me to introduce my old pal, David Ritz. He's an award-winning music writer. David has collaborated on numerous books with, well, among other people, Ray Charles, uh, Willie Nelson, Buddy Guy, Smokey Robinson, B.B. King, Etta James, so many more people. Uh, David is also a biographer, and he wrote the definitive biographies of Marvin Gaye, Aretha Franklin, the great Jimmy Scott, who came from Cleveland right here. Um, overall, David has written about 65 books, I think. Um, he's written dozens of liner notes, and he's also a co-composer, along with Marvin Gaye, of the legendary song Sexual Healing, and we know that that is also a ringtone on his phone. <laughs> that is right. So uh, it, it's an honor to uh, bring on David Ritz. Hi, everybody. Hey. Great to Appreciate it. You. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here. Yeah, well, um, I think we'll turn it over to uh, to Jason, who uh, is going to uh, maybe start the conversation. Yeah, well, I just I thought a good place for all of us to start. I mean, clearly, you know, all four of us have thought a lot about Ray Charles, and I know he's a musician who means uh, a lot to all of us. Uh, and I wanted to just think for a moment here as we start this evening and celebrating his life and legacy and think about the impact that Ray had on rock and roll and quite frankly, on American culture. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine, uh, you know, the last 50 years without a Ray Charles and the impact he had on the world of music and on the world in general. And I thought, you know, maybe David, we could even start out with you a little bit of, what do you think that influence and impact of Ray Charles is and, and his kind of legacy that we're with now? Well, I mean, it's big. <laughs> I mean, it's awfully big. It's up there with, you know, uh, Louis Armstrong, I mean, you know, and Al Jolson and Judy Garland and Frank Sinatra and the Beatles. So, I mean, it, 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 I guess from an historical point of view, the big thing was because he, he, he was a guy who had a lot of guts. And to me, maybe the most important historical, I don't mean the most important historical thing from a musical point of view, but just no one had ever taken a gospel song like he did and turned it into an R&B song. I mean, just actually stole a gospel song and put R&B yeah. lyrics on it with I Got a Woman. And it happened at a time when, you know, there was a lot of uh, superstition about you don't do that, you don't mix those two genres up. And the combination of the genre of country church with big urban R&B really was a... a, a, a a turning point in um, the history of popular music, and then came Aretha, and yeah. 
and on and on and on. But uh, even down to uh, someone like a Kanye West today, who's, who's yeah. As a matter of fact, I was just uh, right. listening to Kanye's album coming over here, uh, uh, coming home, and that's exactly what occurred to me. <laughs> he's done a gospel. I mean, you know, he's done a gospel album in orchestral hip hop uh, extravaganza, and it did make me think of uh, Ray. He's even famously uh, sampled Ray on. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. Um, yeah. And and John, if you if you could answer that question too, what you know your 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 sense of kind of Ray's impact that he that he had on what whether rock and roll or American music in general. Yeah. Well, I would I would definitely lean into American music in general, I and mean, his his impact was so far reaching and so you know incredibly consequential. I mean, he, after he. Uh, did what what David was talking about, which dubbed him the title "The Genius of Soul." Uh, then he went on to basically work in every genre imaginable, right? And rock, pop, soul, jazz. Uh, and one of the one of the really interesting things is he was successful in all of them. And yeah. uh, probably the the other really big groundbreaking thing was his foray into country music, which at the time was somewhat segregated as were race records. And uh, when he, with his version of I Can't Stop Loving You, he created the first worldwide pop hit with a country song. And that was incredibly groundbreaking. It, it broadened the audience for country music in a massive way. And then also being an African-American artist and going to do that. Of course, his, mm -hmm. his, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things he did, he was also a groundbreaking artist in terms of his business acumen his business decisions when when he left atlantic he went to abc because there he could own his masters and he could have complete creative control and uh, john explain that for me because it's funny i think we all would agree that was an incredible move and actually almost unheard of for any artist we should say you know not even including just calling him a you know an african-american artist was able to do that as yeah. a producer explain to the crowd out here and for those who might not understand why is that important owning your masters right because it's, it's sort of a massive deal for him to have done that it's a massive deal and it's, it's, it was totally unprecedented and you know the he had a, a lot of leverage because he had already really established himself as a massive star it's the only way he could do it because from a business standpoint it's difficult for labels to give up that. It's just, you know, the, the, they take a lot of risk. With Ray, they weren't taking as much risk because he was so such a big star. But, you know, the, the, the way the label business works is you take a lot of risk and uh, the long term, sometimes just the long term ownership is the only thing that really bails you out and keeps you going, you know. Um, but in Ray's case, he was able to do that. And, and again, I think probably even more importantly, get creative control where he could do whatever he wanted. And um, yeah. so he shocked him when he said, I'm going to do a country album. Yeah. And they were like, oh, Ray, you don't want to do that. You lose your fan base. It could be a disaster, right. you know, that sort of thing. And um, uh, obviously it worked in a massive way. Uh, and, you know, th I think that's what's really extraordinary about him is there was no genre at the time. There was no genre that he didn't move into and do really, really well. And uh, I don't know of any other artist that's done that so prolifically. Right. And uh, what, you know, what we tried to do in this box, th this was the period in which he expanded. So it was, he, he finished his deal, I think it was in 1959 with Atlantic. Uh, is that right, David? And then, yeah. and then uh, he signed with ABC and that began this really incredibly expansive period, which is the bulk of his career from 1960 to 2004 when he passed. Yeah. And that's what this box represents. And so the idea that we wanted to, or the story that we wanted to tell through the music was this expansive yeah. period where he had his first number one hit, which is the first song in the album, Georgia on my mind, you know, all the way through to in 2004 when he won uh, record of the year with the duo with Nora Jones, here we go again. And all the things he did in between, you'll, you'll hear the, the, his foray into country music and, and all the hits from there. Well, not all the hits, but a lot of the big hits. You'll hear a lot of the songs from different albums that he uh, had great success with, as well as songs that are really beautiful gems, but are, are somewhat overshadowed by the massive hits that uh, were also extraordinary. And you hear him experiment with all kinds of different music. Even There's even a, a song where he... There was a period where he even experimented with disco and he had a really cool version of compared to what and kind of a disco groove. It's just super cool. So, yep. you know, that, I think the, the impact of that 
and just one last point on this is his his approach to singing was also incredibly influential like his combining gospel and r&b and also with sort of the uh, jazz improvisation sensibility yeah created this sort of freestyle that has influenced singers in pretty much all genres and all generations it's funny we were talking about this earlier today but um if ray had only ever just been on atlantic and recorded in the 50s and then stopped yeah. his legacy would be secured he'd be in That's the rock right. and roll hall of fame he would <clears throat> he would have still been in this in the first class even yeah. um, and it's also but, like, no, no, you go ahead, Andy. I apologize. Oh, no, it's, I was just going to say, but of course he went on and did so much so more much, right? and, and it got so much broader because he was able to, maybe he wouldn't have been able to do that on Atlantic because mm -hmm. he signed to ABC, created his own label, owned his own masters, all of that allowed him to kind of do all these things. Go yeah. ahead, David. No, I was just going to add, uh, in terms of creative control, he always had it. Uh, when he signed, when Ahmed um, signed him and Ahmed and Jerry uh Ooh, ooh, Wexler. Ooh, Wexler had them on their label. They didn't produce them. I mean, Jerry told me uh, they turned on, they didn't even have to turn on the lights. They just had to turn on the electricity. So that <laughs> all those all those early hits are his. I mean, he's doing the yeah. orchestrations. Uh, he's, you know, voicing the instruments. He's picking out the songs. Um, and they were intelligent enough as producers to know not to produce him, that he did not need a producer. And and so um, that's extraordinary um, that because of I've never known in my life, just from a personal point of view, I knew him for 28 years. I've, I've never known anybody as confident mm. ever. I, I, he, he had utter confidence. He knew exactly what he could do. And he knew exactly what he really wanted to do, and he did it. And I've also never known anybody as charismatic as he was. I mean, he would grab you when he talked and fall down on the floor and laugh and hit. I mean, he was his gesticulations, his articulation, his combination of speaking kind of country and hip and and I mean, he he was a character of extraordinary dimensions, a presence of, of of charged up electricity. I mean, he was he was lit. It's awesome when you hear that, right? Because that's kind of how you picture Ray Charles when you hear his music, right? Or, or yeah. when you see him in concert. Okay. Because exactly, like, it comes across in his voice that yeah. the confidence, the charisma, and um, it was. I think that even just that's that style of singing was it influenced yeah. a, lot of, a lot of other artists. You know? Yeah, in fact, Andy, that's something I thought we could talk about now too. Is sort of that that well, first of all, maybe the world of artists that influenced Ray. I know you know he often talked about Charles Brown and Nat King Cole, both of whom are also Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. But let's think a little bit about that. You know, sort of the artist who maybe influenced Ray because. I think, John, you were saying it. He really took a lot of influences. And even though he may have been trying to sound like Nat King Cole early on or, you know, Charles Brown for a while, he quickly finds his own voice. It's, it's, it's this really interesting mix of him taking a lot of what was out there, but finding himself in it somehow, right? Oh, 100%. I think, it, you know, when he found his own voice, he never looked back. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I think he heard, he listened to everything. My impression, David probably knows more about this uh, in terms of his, his background. But, you know, my impression of it is that he listened to everything and took in everything and, and borrowed from everything. Anything that he felt was interesting, he would sort of bring it into his own music. Yep. David, did you ever get to talk to Ray about some of that, those artists who influenced him? Well, he yeah, I mean, I, you know, I agree with John. I mean, he's completely eclectic. He loved Artie Shaw. He loved, of course, he loved the great sort of uh, virtuosos who, you know, the main two being Art Tatum and, and um, Errol Gardner, who he idolized them. And then mm -hmm. after Oscar, you know, he, he loved Oscar. And, 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 and the other interesting thing about his career, the overview of his career for me is that, you know, he was a composer. He wrote what I say. I mean, you know, but but as time went on, unlike Duke Ellington or or Marvin Gaye or Stevie Wonder, he stopped composing. 
And I remember asking him, and he could orchestrate. You know, he went to a school for the deaf and blind where he learned to read and write. So he right, wrote right. music well, and he read music well. And I remember asking him, you know, why did you stop? And he said, you know, every year I do a chart just to make sure I can do it. And every year I write a half ass song just to make sure I can do it. But I'm just much more interested in interpreting songs than I am in composing. And I always, now again, you don't want Ray Charles to do any more than he did, other than I kind of did want him to do more than he did. I mean, I, I was always curious because he had this tremendous compositional talent or talent for composition, whatever the right words are. And, 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 and I've always, um, I've, I've always thought how interesting, now, as John just said, the interpretation of Georgia, which was, you know, written by Hoggy Carmichael 400 years earlier, turned out to be this gigantic hit, you know, the number one hit in the country across all the genres. So of course he's, now he's proven that like Nat Cole, he can interpret other people's yeah, right. songs. So he really gives up this other part of his talent and concentrates on right. vocal interpretations, which are, which continue to be um, over over the years increasingly great. He and anyway, it's an amazing point, right, David? When you think about it like that that art as a musician of really reinterpreting someone else's song mm -hmm. at some point becomes almost a compositional thing. I mean, when you think yeah. of Ray's yeah. reinterpreting, you and I, Andy, were talking about his Beatles interpretations right. earlier, right? Yeah. It's as if he makes them a wholly new thing on some level, right. even yeah. going back to the jazz standards, you know, things like uh, the version of making Whoopi, the live version, John, that's on yeah. the box. It's just right. awesome. Right. I mean, that's a song that's been sung by everybody a million times, but he finds a way to make it distinctly his and bring something new to it. Well, it's really well illustrated by the, the country music stuff he started doing in 62. The, yeah. those, those two country and Western albums are, uh, they're, reinter they're just incredibly uh, brand new reinterpretations yeah. of those and, songs. And also what's, in, what's interesting about his relation to country music is that the country artists, you know, working with, you know, Willie Nelson and having known Merle Haggard and blah, 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 they, idolize him and they just don't idolize him because they love the way he sings there are con they are sure he is the one who opened up country music to a larger audience right. and they're grateful to him for enlarging their audience so that was always interesting to me yeah, yeah right who would have known it was ray charles who could have sort of brought country music to the pop charts yes. right, right. <laughs> Um, you know, and what you, what you guys are talking about, it's funny because I, I also thought of the Beatles songs right away when you start talking yeah. about this. I mean, he to take such massive songs and actually own them yeah. is an extraordinary talent, right? And maybe maybe one of his greatest talents. I mean, look at his version of America, right? Which yeah. became our second national anthem is unparalleled, yeah. you know. Um, right. Some of the Beatles songs he's done. I mean, I was, the very last song on, on the record was, uh, we did a, a version of his, um, him singing uh, um, Long and Winding Road. Right. Uh, which obviously a, a Beatles song. And uh, we found a, a tape that was, uh, it was in the, um, the Pablo vaults from uh, Norma Grant's had done something live. And we found some really extraordinary mm. vocals. There was just a, a live performance in Europe. Mm. And uh, the, the recording wasn't so good, except for Ray's vocals, were, which were extraordinary. So we had the uh, Count Basie Orchestra come in and replay the charts around it. And to oh, make it really, wow, right. So this is the, it's the last time, that, because it's, it's yeah. one we released after he passed. Sure. But I just marvel at his vocal performance on that. I mean, it's got everything we're talking about. It, it's a, such a massive song. I mean, how do you, it, who can cover the Beatles and really effectively win? Well, that's exactly. too hard, right? And uh, not only did he do that, but it's one of the best examples I've heard of his vocal improvisation, um, his unique style of singing. And so it's one that we put on there just for, for all those reasons. But yeah, I, I, I think as an interpreter of song, and David, you may have touched on it, that may be arguably his most extraordinary talent. Yeah, I would say, it, just speaking of the Beatles tunes, I know uh, Let It Be is one that I, you know, we've all heard Let It Be 
yeah. thousands of times, right? So right. Um, I didn't, and I, yeah, it's a great song. I probably don't even ever need to hear it again because I can play it in my head. But hearing Ray do it for the first time, yeah. I just thought, wow, I think he's actually maybe even improved yeah. the song. It's just a beautifully <laughs> sung and beautifully played, you know, just mm-hmm. the, even the little piano flourishes are different that he yeah. makes it his. I tell you the other thing that that really made that work for him that that I experienced when I got to work in the studio with him is there was uh, we we're working on some songs and he uh, I wanted him to redo resing something on a particular song and he uh, first first time I asked him he just completely shut me down so I thought well let me see if I can get him laughing about something in a better mood and we'll ask him again <laughs> so I did that didn't work either and then finally the third time I asked him he turned around and he said now nah, listen. I ain't trying to be difficult. It's not that I don't want to re-sing it. It's just that what you have is when I was feeling it. And that's what you want. Mm. Uh-huh. Now, that, that, what a great insight into what, you know, it was yeah. very real with him. And I think one of the reasons he wins everybody over with the, these interpretations is he he felt it. He was there in the moment. Yeah, that's a great point, John, right? It's, it's one of those things where him feeling it and having that emotion in the vocal is more important than having the perfect take in some ways, right? hundred percent, hundred percent. This opens up the door, too, to think about some of the artists who were influenced by Ray, many of whom had a chance, John, through Genius Love's company to work with Ray or many others. I was thinking, you know, uh, I was just talking to Andy earlier today when Billy Joel was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. uh, Baby Grand had just come out. So Ray actually inducts Billy Joel. And it's available on YouTube and that on the Rock Hall channel. If people look, you can watch Ray's speech inducting. Billy, and you can tell that Ray really appreciates him as a musician, as a piano player, uh, as a songwriter. And then Billy Joel walks out to, you know, accept the induction and give his speech. And he basically is like at a loss for words and looks over and he says, it's it's like trying to talk and be inducted here after Mount Rushmore or you know, the, the Washington Monument was out here. Sort of this idea that a national treasure was on stage. And now I've got to somehow accept this uh, honor of being inducted in the Rock Hall. And it's just amazing that influence that Ray had on so many musicians, um, both piano players like Billy Joel, but we mentioned so many other musicians he worked with. Right. And John, oh, maybe we can yeah. start with you, like having those other artists come in for Genius Loves Company, many of the tracks you know, end up on this box set. What was that like having those artists kind of come in and work with Ray? Oh, it was extraordinary just to, I mean, life-changing experience, you know. Um, but one of the things that, that, you know, we talked about this early on, my first conversation with Ray about it, you know, we talked about his far reaching influence and that we would only want to bring people into the record who really got that and felt that. Yeah. So starting with that, you know, I, so I can assure you that everybody that's on Genius Love's company had the most astounding reference for Ray. Then the other thing we did is we wanted to make sure that it was all done in the same room. Cause you might remember this came not too long after Sinatra duets, which was an extraordinary right. technical achievement, but they did yeah, it in different right. rooms, right? That was, that was kind of the story and why it was so cool. But I wanted to get people in the room with Ray and let, kind of let the fireworks happen, the real connectivity yeah. happen. So we did it pretty much all the duets, you know, face to face, literally in a, in a live take with the band in most cases. Mm-hmm. And um, the thing that I observed was that when Ray and Willie Nelson would walk in the room, for example, in front of a, we had a 90 piece orchestra over at the Eastwood scoring stage in Burbank and the entire orchestra leaned in and they were just so, you know, Oh my God, these two giants are here, you know, and you get that kind of reaction. And then even from the guest artists in general, when they'd walk into the room with Ray, they'd have that sort of reaction. Like, Oh shit. Yeah. Even, you know, maybe not so much with Billy and BB King. I mean, Willie and BB King, cause they were, really close and, and really yeah. good friends, but, you know, um, and, and very familiar with Ray, but, uh, you know, some of the other artists who didn't, hadn't spent as much time with him, you could tell they were just kind of like, wow, you know, this guy's, this is the guy. Right. I'm in a room with him. I can't believe it. <laughs> right. Right. And imagine what it's like to have Ray cover your song too. I, yeah. I was just looking at the, the list of songs on true genius and I, even, even the Beatles. I mean, imagine you're, you're Paul McCartney. You, you, you've, you're pretty legendary, you know, <laughs> and Ray, Ray Charles is covering your song. It still yeah. has to be a, a feather in your cap. No doubt. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine what it's like to be the writer and have him interpret him. It yeah, must be yeah, absolutely. Extraordinary. Right. 
you know, uh, another interesting aspect of all of this is when you were playing uh, Hit the Road Jack, I was listening to it and, and remembering Ray's relationship to Percy uh, Mayfield, who composed mm. the song, one of the great blues uh, singers ever, and Margie Hendrix singing her part. And she's one of the great unsung R&B uh, vocalists of all time. And all the musicians who Ray nurtured, um, Fathead Newman, Hank Crawford, uh, Leroy Cooper, sort of the Harry Carney of, of R&B, uh, uh, Aritone uh, saxophones, Johnny Coles, who Gil Evans wrote an entire composition for. So like Ellington had Johnny Hodges and Ben Wester and Lester Young, so did Ray cultivate an enormous group of uh, talented uh, uh, jazz artists. They were mainly jazz artists because Ray's attitude is if you could play jazz, you could play anything. So he always <laughs> demanded that his instrumentalists be jazz artists and jazz was, and, uh, and uh, Ray was a jazz artist. I mean, you know, he could play if he wanted to like um, Bud uh, Powell so that it's both people he influenced, which is everybody, but it's also people that he cultivated. And of course, um, Fathead went on to have his own career and influenced David uh, Amborn in a whole world of, of instrumentalists. Um, and, 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 and so it's, it's um, easy to, f it's easy to uh, forget um, the culture that he created in his own orchestra, both his little, uh, both his little band and his big band. And after the era where the big band was sort of dead, yeah, he right. on forever. And and at cost to him, he didn't make. A, in other words, if you're in Germany or you're in England, you're going to pay as much to see Ray Charles with a trio as you are with a big band. He wanted the big band there because he loved a big band. He wanted to get his ass kicked by a band screaming behind him. So he was a, he, 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 he was a, uh, um, um, you know, he was a motherfucker. I mean, he, he, he was strong, man. He was strong. <laughs> and he got exactly what he wanted to when he wanted to uh, get it. I'll say, too, to remind everybody out there, if you've got any questions for us, uh, David and John, please put them in the comments. We'll be looking at those questions throughout the second part of our program here. We're happy to ask it to the panel. Um, Andy, you know, you and I were talking about all this great stuff we're looking at here, but this kind of idea of trying to even archive someone like Ray Charles or collect Ray Charles or something, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and even, you know, and well, and related to that, how do, how, how do you put together, uh, how do you chronicle somebody like this? Somebody so, so huge uh, in so many ways, whether you're um, curating an exhibit or putting yeah. together a box set or writing a book, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, yeah, I would, I would kind of maybe put that question to, um, to maybe start with David even uh, as when you when you worked with Ray on his on his autobiography, um, you know how how do you go about how do you go about something like especially with somebody who's got such a varied and rich career? Well, it ties into what John was talking about before that it's all about his voice. I mean, what what I really loved about him was his voice. And when I started working with him, I got this. It, and the epiphany was you learn to speak before you learn to sing so that as I heard him talk, you know, this is like hundreds of hours of him talking to me, I heard the music in his voice and heard how his conversational cadence determined his vocal style. He'd cut off words in the middle. He'd grunt, he'd groan. He just had his own way. So my goal was to channel the uh, mm, 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 
idiocy and the urgency of his of his voice because it was so intense mm -hmm. and so raw and and um, funky and also full of um, of um, of um, humor because his you know mm -hmm. one thing people don't talk about very much but Ray's a humorous artist. We we're talking about the live version of making Whoopi and yeah. 18 different examples of his. He's just having a good time. And, yeah. and, and, and so the answer to your question was, my goal was to capture his voice. So when you read the book, you not only hear him speaking, but you hear the musicality in his voice. Yeah. Right. And, and John, uh, kind of a similar, maybe if you could uh, speak to how you went about selecting when you're trying to chronicle, you know, 40 some years of, of, of such a varied career. Um, how do you go about selecting the right songs, you know, the right pieces, the right live tracks to kind of represent somebody like that? Yeah, well, it's 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 interesting because ninety songs is a ton of music, but then when you start to look at Ray's career, you're you're just hitting the surface. Yeah, you know? right. Um, so obviously, you know, there there are big songs that had to be included, and uh, also wanted to make sure we covered the range of genres because I really do think that his his conquering every genre in sight is is one of his most extraordinary achievements. And then the other thing that we wanted to do was we did it chronologically because it's interesting. You can, you can kind of go through this journey with Ray as he explores different kinds of music and develops and expands his horizons. And so it, it goes, you know, chronologically from 19, his first number one hit 1960 to, you know, 2004. Uh, and I think that's kind of a fun aspect too, that you really hear these things sort of evolve. You hear them evolve with the times. You can hear the influence of what's happening in, in, pop music in general and right. how he, he's adapting and incorporating new things that are happening. You can hear him embrace new forms of production and mm -hmm. technology as he moves along. So he's a guy, you know, and what's probably most extraordinary about it is how he was able to stay relevant and have hits like big songs over and over and over again for that, you know, almost 50 years. Um, maybe David, you could, you could um, speak to this and then see if John, you, you might, uh, weigh in as well, but you both worked with him um, and knew him uh, well. How how do you think he thought about his legacy, and how how would he, how did he want to be remembered? Um, yeah. I, you know, I, this is going to sound cold blooded, but I don't think he cared. I mean, I mean, he was a guy who was in the sort of moment. You know, he was cutting an album. He was on an airplane. He wanted to... I, I remember the first time we took a plane trip together to New York to do SNL that time that he did S, SNL. And I was sitting next to him. I was so excited. I said, you know, I said, oh, man, we're going to get to talk for five and a half hours. And he said, man, I wouldn't talk to my mama now. She came out the grave. I mean, he, I mean, he just, he just kind of zed out and he was a sleep the whole time. And when the plane landed, he opened his eyes. So my sense of Ray, particularly when we got at the end of the book, when I asked him what you're asking me, was, you know, who gives a shit? I mean, I've got these, I've got this music. I think it's good. Yeah. It will endure or won't endure but 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 i don't think he he was very much um in the mix you know he, he was doing what he was doing and 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 you have to remember also he was a conservative he conserved money he he died wealthy in an age when not many artists who came up the way he came up were able to uh mass a uh Orchard and keep it. So he conserved, um, and 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 also it's interesting when we're talking about the different genres of music that he conquered. There was one genre he didn't conquer that he didn't like, and just as Louis Armstrong rejected um, bebop, right. we didn't like hip hop, and, and we had long discussions. And he thought those guys don't know how to play instruments and blah 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 blah. So his, it, 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 I mean. He, now, some of his early recordings, you hear him talking rhythmically and, the, you know, so he understood that you can 
put poetry over music, but he had uh, uh, no love of the hip hop that was emerging in his lifetime. And, um, um, but you know, what the hell? Not everybody does. Uh, John, do you have a sense of whether Ray uh, thought about his legacy, you know, while you were working with him? Yeah, it's, it's not something that we ever talked about. Right. Um, I just know that uh, Valerie Irvin, the head of the foundation, um, who's been, you know, by the way, this this whole box set and launch of music for his 90th, it was all her idea mm -hmm. wanted to do something special for Ray. And, um uh, he told, he told her right before we released Genius Loves Company, um, and as he was ill and knew he was dying, you know, he told her it was really important to him that this record came out, Genius Loves Company, and that his movie came out, which came out a few months after the record. Uh, um, so, I mean, he cared to that extent. That's all I really know. I mean, the other thing is he cared to set up a foundation that yep. would, uh, yeah. and the, the foundation has a great mission, uh, it's it uh, supports research and help for hearing disorders because his feeling was that if you couldn't hear, you were really disabled. That blind blindness wasn't a disability, but right, exactly, yeah. and uh, and and black education. And so, um, you know, he wanted to give back, and he wanted that to continue, and that's why he set up his estate. So I, I know those, well, I know those things were important to him. You know, I should only add this one thing about his. Um, legacy because it just occurred to me i went to visit him in the office when he was dying they put a uh, they put um a bed in his office and people would come by and visit and mm -hmm. the last time we were together and i wrote this in the article i wrote about him uh, uh, the article the kind of long obituary i, I wrote for uh rolling stone was that he told me to be sure and apologize to the muse, to the muse physicians to whom he had been short or curt, because he had a habit of when he would rehearse, he would wouldn't call the musicians by their names. He would call me, you know, first trumpet, third trombone, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you know, he had a long dis dispute with the anyway, he could have an acrimonious relationship because he was a tough guy and he uh, uh, he could be short tempered. And, and I, I, I remember how he really touched my heart when he said, be sure and tell the cats, I apologize to him if mm -hmm. I did anything that hurt him. And I, that was completely new for me to hear that from, wow. from Ray. And I really, really appreciated it. And the guys who read the article really appreciated it too. So I think that's part of his, legacy that um uh, uh because while he was alive i didn't hear a lot of apologies hmm. that's nice yeah right amazing <clears throat> our producer just sent me over a question here that came in from youtube uh joe out there on youtube hello joe uh coming back to something you had talked about john about you know ray kind of locking in on the music there and talking about that emotion and that feeling um and joe wanted to know from either of you was there ever a moment where you're able to recognize sort of Ray locking in on that sort of emotional moment in the music? Did either of you ever have a moment with him where you witnessed Ray connecting to the music in that sort of direct and almost spiritual way? Oh, All yeah. the time. I mean, every, yeah, I was going to say <laughs> exactly. everything, pretty much everything he's saying. Uh, right, right. I, I agree with John. I mean, that's, he just got there in her. He was in the zone, man. He got in there. He, he, Right. He was, you know, he was bad. I mean, he he just got he he just got there in a hurry. That was wow. his thing. I mean, he would come into we 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 would go to record a song. It would kind of go something like this: we'd have the the band would be ready, the guest would be ready, everybody waiting for Ray to walk in. And if he had a session that started at two o'clock, Ray walked in at two o'clock. Oh yeah, completely punctual, completely prepared, ready to go, and he would sing it. You know maybe two or three times that was it mm. and he'd get there right away if he you know he, the extra takes sometimes we didn't need him sometimes it'd be the first take with him wow. um, but that was his whole i think that was 
yeah, it, it's basically how he sang. And if he wasn't, if he wasn't, if he wasn't getting there, it, it would be, you know, there might be something he's trying to figure out. I, mean, I had him stop a session one time. This was extraordinary. We were doing Heaven Help Us All, and he didn't really like the, the way the arrangement was written. So he stopped, and he sang everybody's parts in the whole room. <laughs> and the bass line, he started singing the different vocal parts for the for the choir. He started, you know, t- bass player, I want you to play this. And, you know, uh, even kind of the drum groove and, and, you know, harmonic changes, the whole thing. It was really extraordinary to watch him do that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, so technical things like that, would he would stop to correct or fix. But yeah. when it came to, like, actually singing and emoting, it seemed to be kind of the only way he knew how to do it. Yeah. But do you know the other interesting thing, John? You caught him towards the end where he was more amiable to be produced. I mean, not many people produced him. I mean, you know, you, know. you and a handful of other people produced him, right? When I first met him and I came out to L.A., I had never been in a recording studio before. And I didn't know about vocal editing. I just thought you got up and you sang. I didn't know that you could sort of punch in and punch out, right? Uh-huh. So he was doing... Um, a song, I forgot which one, but anyway, I heard the first take and I went, this is the greatest thing anyone's ever done in the history of the world, right? Right. Two days later, he was still punching in grunts and groans that to me seemed arbitrary. I mean, they're all great. I mean, all the versions were good, but I, but because he was an engineer, and that's the other thing, John, when you had him, he wasn't doing his own engineering, right? You had Al Schmidt or somebody, right? Right. I mean, he he did a little bit, um, yeah. and he was certainly capable. He could get around the studio all by himself. Right. So when I first came out to L.A. and started hanging out with him in 1970s, he was doing all his engineering. Yeah. And had the microphone in the booth. And it was crazy. And and so he loved to toy. He was very mechanical. You know, he knew airplane engines, car engines, and everything else. So it, it, it was, it, it was, I often wondered whether the vocal he turned out after two or three or four days of editing was any better than the original one he did. But he heard it in a way that, we um, didn't, but he was a very patient artisan when it came to studio work. Yeah, David, yeah. we should mention that for some of the viewers out here, too. I mean, that was kind of the idea of, of forming RPM in the first place, right? Was that he was able to have everything right. under that roof, everything yeah. together, and he would yeah. know it sort of like the back of his hand, right. from recording to producing to all yeah. of those pieces, right? Sure. Right, and also he brought out Tom... Uh, who was the great Atlantic pioneering engineering and had Tommy Dowd set up his recording studio in LA and he bought the building where the, where the uh, foundation is today. And he controlled his own um, universe as much as he, he, I mean, everything right from right. his plane to his tour bus to his management company to his publishing to you know his record company yeah. um he really you know the expansion that happened during this period of the music he also expanded into basically a completely self-sufficient which is interesting yeah. when you watch the movie and you talk about his lessons from his mother um which you wrote about david you know he him not relying on anyone, I think, was his main objective about, yeah. you know, we, we talked earlier about owning his masters or whatever. It was, I think it was more about just being completely self-sufficient and in control and he could do whatever he wanted to do. And he set himself up that way. Yeah. I, I, I have this, uh, I, I have this very vivid memory of him um, walking around his office and his studio with these keys it looked like he had 80 keys on a chain and it was a key to everything. This cabinet, this cabinet, the studio, the tapes. Oh. I mean, he had the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> literally. <laughs> and he was literally. And he was the king, by the way. Huh? He was the king, by the way. He really was, you know, he was. Well, uh, John, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, we, oh, we've, we've talked about the box set a bit, but if you could talk about just 
how it came about, when when the, the idea first started to do this, and and just how it how it came about. Oh, absolutely. Well, as I mentioned, this was uh, really the brainchild of Valerie Irvin, who runs a foundation. And, you know, I first met Valerie when I started working with Ray on the Genesis Company record, and and I got to tell you, she was. That record couldn't have gotten made without her. She was incredibly helpful and helped guide me. And uh, David, you mentioned not a lot of people had produced him. Well, he he hated me for a good six months too. It was it was <laughs> perfect. I, I think he was doing a little, you know, t- testing the waters before he would die. Sure he was comfortable with the whole thing. Although he did ask me too, and I was, I was of course honored and and also, you know, uh, even though it was a little scary, I, I yeah. certainly didn't want to miss the opportunity. Um, but Valerie wanted to uh, do something really special, and she's deliberately held back a lot of this music while the industry mm. is going through the transition to streaming, right? It's been a, it's been a kind of a rocky thing when now it's really growing again, and it's a, it's a wonderful development for the business. Um, but there were some rough years in all that, you know, especially for for music companies and artists and songwriters, and we were, you know, songwriters are still a bit challenged with it, yeah. but. Um, Anyway, so the idea was to put out something special for his 90th. It got a little bit, you know, rocky because of uh, COVID and things like that. So it's, you know, here we are on his 91st birthday. It did come out in the 90th year, but somewhat delayed. Anyway, do something really special. Do something that that did sort of tell a story about this being the bulk of his career and the most expansive period and where he really defined himself to be undefinable. And, um, And so... You know, much of this has not been on streaming services because mm-hmm. some, some of it has been out, but a lot of it before streaming services were really proliferated, proliferated in, into the um, into people's you know consumption method. It was very new, not a lot, and uh, so most of this is new to all the services, um, which I think is really exciting. And That's great. Uh, um, and then the box is kind of a you know. A showpiece. We also wanted to do something really special in the box with the unreleased uh, live concert from Stockholm in 1972. Yeah, John, and, tell us a little bit about that. Andy and I were talking about that. That's incredibly well recorded and some great yeah. performances there. And I can't remember hearing that before. Is that is that entirely it's never been released? No, it's never been released. So yeah, what we also wanted to do in this was to find you know rare gems. And so there's singles on here that were never on albums that were really terrific really important songs for Ray, but not not that sort of under distributed because they were never part of an album. And in the old world, pre, prior to streaming singles, you know, if you had the 45 or something, that, or maybe you could download it here and there, but a lot of time that stuff wasn't distributed. Um, so there's a ton of great tracks like that within the 90. And in addition to the 90, for people who buy the physical box, they get a bonus album, which is this wonderful live concert we found from 1972 in Stockholm. And as you pointed out, which really struck me is it's really well recorded. Yeah. And it's probably one of Ray's, you know, top performances. He, he sounds fantastic. The band sounds yeah. fantastic. Um, it, it was just a, a great moment. And so we were lucky to find that and we put it together and made it its own album. So that's disc number six. Just even you talk about, you know, David, you were talking earlier about just how humorous he was and how fun. And that Stockholm 72 concert, John, you really hear that. He's having fun with the band. You know, the yeah. way he's playing off the Raylettes back and forth. And they sound fantastic on the recording. Yeah, that's a cool thing on there, too. There's a track where he really, you know, gives them a moment to shine. So you get a window into the Raylettes during that period. Um, yeah, his interaction with the audience is a lot of fun. He's he, did, As David was talking about earlier, he had the most amazing personality. And you hear that in... in in that concert definitely definitely his personality comes through it he's very playful with the audience mm-hmm. but with the band as well um every song sounds different too i mean the, the arrangements are obviously really varied from one song to the next with mm-hmm. but it's the same band it's right. kind of hard to it's almost like you're listening to an album that just has you know different arrangements but uh it's it's amazing how great that and versatile that yeah. band is. Hard to imagine it's one band doing that live, <laughs> a live show, right? Yeah. Let me tell you, if you're going to play with Ray, you better be on your game as a musician. <laughs> right, right. And um, uh, yeah. I think what Dave was talking about, you know, sometimes he was a little harsh, but he demanded perfection. He demanded, yeah. you know, people were at their best. When it came to music, there was no screwing around in that respect. He, he would have fun, right? He'd have fun with the audience. He'd have fun with the musicians. But yeah. um, God help you if you didn't play it right. That was a different <laughs> right. scenario. 
<laughs> uh, we had a couple of people here, Patricia and Ricky, both out there in the audience listening tonight. And they both sort of asked the same question um, for both of you guys, John and David. Is there a one or two favorite Ray Charles songs or even a deep cut that you would say for listeners out there tonight, you would recommend they, they get off off of this event and go out and listen to it. Could you pick one or two songs or even a deep cut to, to recommend to the audience listening tonight? David, you want maybe start with you? You mean the songs that aren't on this box? Oh, anything. Could be anything. Just your kind of, uh, if you well, were going to recommend a Ray Charles tune, who, what do they start with? What do they listen to? Oh, where, where do they start? I mean, they can start anywhere, man. They, 1955, 1975. I mean, you know. Uh, but I just, it, 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 it just, well, here's what's coming to my mind. You know, I think Tony Joe White wrote Rainy Night in Georgia, right? And and it was a big hit with Brooke Benton. And then Ray covered it on one of his albums. And Ray, in the beginning, acts as though he's drunk. He plays the part of a bum in a in mm. a boxcar. And then he proceeds to sing the shit out of the song. <laughs> and, and really funks it up. And I love that. Uh, there's a Percy Mayfield song called On the Other Hand, uh, Baby with Ray plays piano. It's just a piano trio. And to me, it's one of the perfect 12 bar blues ever written but then you know everything is great so i mean i i you ask me at a different time i'll tell you right. uh, four or five different uh, uh uh songs i used to love to go to his uh, shows when i was doing the books i went to all the um shows and he would do am i blue which is of the one of the atlantic albums where he's singing the ballads and there's a trumpet solo that Johnny Cole would play, the great Johnny Cole, who was this yeah. incredible trumpet player. And Ray used to, before Johnny would play, Ray would say, explain it, Johnny. And Johnny would play his solo. And I always waited for the moment when Ray <laughs> would say, explain it. So, but John has his own, so you go ahead, John. By the way, there's yeah. a great version of M.I. Blue, a live version of that on the, on the box yeah. set here. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was just going to mention yeah, that. It was right, from, right. It was from uh, Live in Japan. It was nice right, to... right, right. That yeah. album. Really, also, you know, yeah. very, uh, it's been very hard to find for years, you know, because it was mainly a Japanese release. Um, yeah. Got down, I mean, that's a super tough question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I guess I'd have to try and call out some of the songs that aren't as well known. You know that aren't the big hits because I mean the big hits are incredible, but I'm assuming people have probably heard most of them, right? At some point, um, I, mean, I really like uh, "I'm a Fool to Care." Oh, yeah. His vocal performance in that is so powerful and strong, and you really you really hear the confidence that uh, that David was talking about. Um, no one, it's a really fun song, um, great R and B song. You know, I'm surprised it's not. You know, more well known and kind of a bigger hit. Um, the, the making whoopee that you guys have mentioned a couple of times. I mean, right. of live tracks, that's that's got to be up there in terms of you know one of the greatest moments. I think that was recorded at the Shrine in L.A. Oh, um, yeah. Really, just an incredible moment. Uh, shows his personality, shows his yeah. range, shows his interpretive skills in terms of you know really changing a song and making it his own. And how much he can draw the audience in with him, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you could feel you feel like you're in the room. It's just there's such a vibe to it. Um, all the Beatles material to me is really yeah. interesting. Great. Yeah. I mean, there's I think there's six Beatles songs on this or five Beatles songs on this. Yeah. You know, the one I mentioned earlier, um, "Long and Winding Road," I think is really worth a listen if you're not familiar with Ray. I, I've actually used that to try and you know for people who didn't know Ray very well to try mm. and illustrate what was so extraordinary about his, his vocal interpretations. I think I, think I talked about that earlier. Um, God, there's so much, there's just so much in here. I mean, you know, the other thing that the, some of the duets, like, uh, you know, like I did with Billy Joel, Chaka Khan, I'll be good to you. Um, you know, he also had a really, really, and I learned a lot from him about singing with other people and how to make that work. Mm. And it was here, this is another thing that he was just a genius at. Um, you know, and the song that's that we had on here from Genius Those Company, Here We Go Again with Nora Jones was oh, really, I mean, that track really, is fan 
first song off the album, I think, right? On the original Genius Love. Yeah, song. yeah. And it was I mean, just, it's what an amazing uh, performance with the two of them. And won a Grammy, correct? Uh, uh, song of the be, Year. Yeah. Song of the yeah, Year. Yeah, yeah, Record of the Year. Um, of the year. It was, you know, it was just, it was one of those moments. He didn't really, he wasn't super familiar with her. So he, he met her at the studio that day. And, and she, uh, was, she was still fairly new at that point yeah. when they recorded that, right, John? I think she was still kind of up and coming back then. Kind of, yeah. What happened was uh, she was she was sort of exploding in the jazz world first, and yeah. then from there, and she became you know massive, and everybody on the, everybody on the planet knew who she was. Well, yeah, right. I was reading in uh, one of the early articles about her, and she cited Ray as one of her most, if not her most, important influence. Mm. And so, so I went, I went to Ray and I said, you know, there's this up and coming singer that I think we ought to record. And he said, I'm, I'm not that familiar with her, but uh, he said and he kind of gave me that one. Most of the time, he was very particular. He would say no more than yes right but uh with that one he, he, had, a, he had an interesting take on it. he said well if you think so let's do it so he didn't spend much time on it and then i, I said i brought it to him i said so well what song do you want to do because what do you think i said well i think one of the country songs would be interesting with her because she has it's a jazz singer but she's also you know has influence of americana and country yeah and right i think it would be a good fit and then uh and then she picked here we go again and so i went to ray again i said what what about the key? What do you think about what, the key? And he said, oh, man, I can sing the phone book. You let her pick the key. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right. Uh, so she came back, she picked the key, and then she came to the studio that day. And, and like I, I, I told you guys a setup where everyone would be in the room waiting for Ray. He'd walk in and we'd go, right? <laughs> this time, when, when the session was just about to start, he said, you know, bring her down to my office. And he had a little upright piano in his office. Hmm. And he was sitting at the piano bench. And so Nora and I came walking in. And he said, uh, I'll sit right here, darling. And she sits next to him and he says, all right. And th th he was famous for this, too. So as a producer, we, we come up with what we call routines and duets, which is who sings what part, when and where and all that, right? Well, I'd spent a bunch of time trying to think that through. We talked to the guest artists about it. And as soon as we get to the studio, Ray would just start changing stuff. <laughs> in fact, he did, that, he did it famously on the Elton John track. And... Um, uh, Elton said Elton had spent quite a bit of time with myself and Phil Ramone, who who mm -hmm. worked with us on that track, and and we later he came early. He really wanted to be ready, and so we spent a bunch of time kind of getting the routine figured out. And uh, Ray came in, and started changing everything, and Elton said, "Well, that's not what they that's not what they were telling me earlier." And he goes, "Who's they? One of those you and me." <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so with Nora, he came in. The first thing he did, he started changing. He said, "Okay, you start the song because we were going to do it in the harmony. This is like a, a third mm. harmony that goes throughout the track. We were going to do it that way." And that's what Nora and I had talked about. And Ray just said, "No, you take the first verse. I'll take the second verse." And she said, "Well, Ray, I think I'm going to. Um, if we're going to do that, would you mind if we change the key? Because I was I was thinking about the harmony when we set the key." And he said, "No, no, no, don't do it." Like Here's what you do. Start up there anyway and work your way down. He started doing this Ray Charles classic improvisation like only Ray could do. And then she did it. And I remember he he turned around. This is the funniest thing. Like turned around and looked at me and said, man, you were right. Just <laughs> love Nora. Just love Nora. And uh, so there was wow. a certain, from that point on, there was this real sort of chemistry. And, and I think it's one of the things that made that track so special. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned the word genius, John, and I wanted to uh, ask you how you do you remember how, when or how you settled on the title True Genius for the box set? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it was tough to, you know, the genius has been used so much with him. Sure. Right? Yeah. And, uh, but there's a couple of things, you know, I just started to think about what really, and, and after putting all this repertoire together and thinking it through, um, and then also, it, it's it's extracted from a quote from Frank Sinatra, who said, you know, the only true genius in our business is Ray Charles. Got it. And it, it just sort of seemed like what he was talking about was that Ray, <laughs> Ray didn't seem to have boundaries. If he he was able to do anything he wanted to do musically and be really successful at it, which yeah. is quite extraordinary. And so, you know, as David was talking about, I mean, he could arrange, he could write, he could play. He could obviously sing, um, and he could take that into any any style that that appealed to him, any any genre, you know, any kind of rhythm. So, I think uh, you know we thought that this this box itself really told that story. You really get a glimpse into the range, the incredible range that really only Ray had, 
and there's yeah. another Ray Charles. So that this this box is in, in, intended to reflect his true genius and, and tell that story in a in musical way. Yeah, well, thank you for it, John. Uh, it's it's really fantastic, beautiful uh, box, the physical piece, and great to have all that music on streaming. We're just about to close out here now, so I wonder if each of you guys, if there's any closing thoughts you'd like to leave us with uh, about Ray Charles or leave the audience with, I should say. David, anything you want to leave us with tonight? Well, I mean, it's it was a blessing of my life, one of the great blessings of my life to have met him and worked with him and have known him all the years. I, I mean, I loved him. Um, he, he, he was a tough guy. I, I, mean, I mean, he was really a tough guy. But his toughness, his toughness, was combined with a tenderness and the coalition of the two, the kind of mixture of his tenderness and his toughness um, created um, a vulnerability in his voice, in his speaking voice and in his musical voice that touched my heart. And it changed my life. I mean, you know, when I came to him, I hadn't written a book. I didn't have the credentials and it was like I came in and I had to send him telegrams in Braille to get to him and finally met me and I said I loved him and I knew his music and I would try to capture his voice and he said okay and <laughs> let me write this book, book that I wrote so I'll always be grateful to him and of course you know I love his music as much now as I did when I was an eight-year-old kid when I first heard it. So I don't think he's going to go anywhere. I mean, I think like like all the greats, like Chopin or Beethoven or whoever the hell you want to mention, I, I kind of think he's here forever um, because he could express so much emotion in his voice. I think we'd agree with that, Andy, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. John, how about you? Any final closing thoughts you want to leave us with about Ray? Well, uh, first of all, well said, David. Um, I'm not sure what I can add to that other than to say, you know, certainly changed my life. And, and the, the funny thing is, like, my very first memories of music were Ray Charles. It, it's funny how things work out that way. And so by the time I got to know him, I knew all his repertoire really well. You know, it was, it was almost like, you know, all those years and years of listening and listening, you know, suddenly it was to find myself in that situation with him to work with him was both a dream come true and something that uh, I'd sort of unknowingly prepared for. Um, but I, and I learned just a ton from him. And uh, he, I think what David said is a, is a great way to characterize it. He was tough. He was incredibly demanding when it came to getting the work done, but you know, and he didn't, he didn't let a lot of people in and I feel so blessed and humbled and lucky to have been, able to get close to him and in making music, which is, I think, you know, the probably the most important part of his life. So that was just an extraordinary experience. And, uh, you know, again, I, I hope that, uh, what we always try and do is honor, honor the artist, honor the music, you know, it, uh, you know, my new company, that's, that's really what we're about. And, um, and so, you know, I hope this is a is a fitting tribute to Ray, who, without a doubt, is one of the greatest artists of all time. Yeah. Well, we're glad you did it, John, and uh, congrats on the box set. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, that sentiment from both of you that Ray's music will live on, clearly, you know, as a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, what we do here every day to honor and preserve this history and share this history with people about the music. Um, it's it's an honor for us every day to be able to you know think of Ray Charles, one of the inaugural class, the first class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And thank you to both of you guys again for everything you've been doing in your careers to preserve that music and share it with everyone. Thank you to Valerie at the foundation too, uh, you know, for being involved in the box set and helping us put together tonight. And uh, thank you to everyone out there. Hopefully we'll all be leaving this program tonight and throwing on some Ray Charles records uh, for the rest of the evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Happy right. birthday, Ray. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everybody.